Okay, great. Um, sorry for the delay. Uh, Lena, we have a great crowd here and very enthusiastic waiting for your talk. So we're very excited. Alina who was a, a research scientist that worked uh, with us here. Now uh, as a professor at very MSD, Missouri Science Technology. And uh, she's going to talk to us about binary phase dynamics. So thank you, Helena, and please go ahead. Thank you, JP. Good morning, everyone. I cannot see any of, of you, so I don't know who is in the room. Um, and it's hard for me to hear, so you'll have to, if there are questions, you have to ask very loudly, okay? I will repeat uh, questions. Okay, okay, good, thank you. All right, so in the previous uh, lecture, you heard uh, all about different kinds of crystal growth, right? And also about, you know, what mistakes um, not to make. Um, so you do have your furnace, right? And you have, you, you purchase a bunch of elements or you haven't purchased them yet, but you're just deciding what, what you want to grow. So how do you go about it? Well, uh, you need to know something about phase diagram. Um, and all the database about the phase diagrams can be found in ASM alloy phase diagram database. Um, those are um, two component, three component phase diagrams. All the um, reported uh, compounds that are um, that have been discovered are reported in the crystallography open database and uh, into in the IS, ICSD. <clears throat> so these kind of three, the most important um, literature that you should be familiar with or look for. Um, that that should be like your um, like your table bible in a way, um, or or desktop bible. <laughs> Uh, but these are the sources of uh, the most important sources of information for crystal grow growers. All right, before we go into the um, phase diagrams, we need to know some vocabulary. Um, so first it's uh, systems. What a system, uh, a physical system consists of a substance or group, a group of substances, uh, and they are isolated from surroundings. Isolated means that there's no interchange of mass between those, uh, the substance or substances, thank you. Uh, and uh, its surroundings. So we have alloy systems. Uh, the substances, substances there are two metals, copper and zinc, or it could be a metal and non-metal. In that case, it's uh, iron and car uh, carbon. Uh, a metal and intermetallic compound, it can be iron and cementite. Um, that's a compound. Iron three, <laughs> carbon. Uh, it can be several metals aluminum, mag magnesium, and um, manganese. These substances constitute uh, the compounds that comprise the system, and they should not be confused with the various phases found within the system, and you'll see what I mean later on. A system can also consist of a single element, a sing right, that would be a single component system. A phase, uh, is defined as a physically distinct and chemically homogeneous portion of a system that has a particular chemical composition and structure. For example, water in the liquid or vapor state is a single phase. When you have an ice that floats in water, that is an example of two phase system. State variables are composition, temperature, pressure, magnetic field, um, electric field, gravitational field, and so on. There's there are three different types of, of equilibrium. Uh, there is stable, un unstable, and metastable. The stable equilibrium exists when the object is in its lowest energy condition. Metastable equilibrium will be when we need, just, uh, we need to apply additional energy uh, in order to move that object from that metastable into true stable uh, position. An unstable equilibrium exists when no additional energy is needed before reaching uh, metastability or um, stability. Polymorphism. Um, some elements like iron shown here, um, you see temperature and pressure uh, diagram. 
Um, so iron can be found in, um, in three different um, polymorphic states or um, allo, uh, have, can have a three distinct allotropic, uh, allotropic states. So what it means, uh, it means that the structure of iron um, transforms from one crystal structure to another as we change temperature and pressure. So in this case, for iron, uh, iron transform as we increase the temperature from uh, alpha iron, which is BCC, to gamma iron to delta iron, right? You can also see it here on this line, on the temperature line, right? Um, and so each of these uh, unique structure is actually a distinctive separate phase, right? As you can see this distinctive separate phase, which is shown by different colors um, in this phase diagram. Um, also on this diagram here for um, iron versus um, percent of uh, carbon, you can see these uh, allotropic states here um, just marked by different colors, right? Here also sh shows you delta, alpha, and alpha plus gamma. Um, you can reach metastable, you can obtain metastable phases when you do um, a rapid uh, freezing. Um, and that is a common method um, actually to produce these metastable structures. For example, um, this is cementite that I mentioned before, iron-3 um, carbon can be produced actually at a moderately slow rate. But with extremely rapid freezing, um, even thermodynamically unstable structures such as uh, amorphous glasses can be produced. So it's not like you always can um, get the stable phases, but metastable ones can also be um, grown. So phase diagrams. Also constitutional diagrams or equilibrium diagrams, phase diagrams as we know them too. Uh, it can be um, a single component phase diagram. And in that case, it can be simply 1D or 2D plot. Um, and like we already saw, it could be where there is a phase changes as a function of temperature and pressure. We will actually look at one uh, on the next slide. Uh, however, most of the diagrams, um, and especially the ones that will be used for the crystal growth, are 2D or 3D plots, and they will describe uh, the phase relationship in systems made up of two, um, three, four, and so on components. And these usually have different areas of fields that have either um, a single phase or a mixed phase, and so on. So, phase rule. Uh, it was first announced by Gibbs and William uh, Willard Gibbs in 1876, and it relates the physical state of a mixture to the number of constituents in the system and to its conditions. He was also the first to call homogeneous region in the system by the term phase. So I guess we should be uh, thankful to him for phase, um, phase diagrams and phase and so on. So we have, and we have if we have only two state variables like pressure and temperature, these are the most common in the lab. Um, this rule can be written as follows. We have uh, the degree of freedom, which is F, independent degrees of freedom equals to the number of components C minus number of stable phases in the system plus two. So here stands for temperature and pressure, right? Because we have two state variables. So. If we have a um, one component system, uh, here have a water, so one component, C is one. Here's the phase diagram of water. We have pressure, we have temperature, and we have three distinct phases here, right? We have solid, liquid, and gas. So for the phases, the P number is three. Uh, we can go from solid to liquid either uh, through Either, either we can go from solid to liquid through melting, we can go from liquid to, liquid to solid through freezing, uh, and the same for between the liquid and gas, it's either we condense or vaporize, right? And you know, it's a sublimation or deposition if we go directly from solid to gas. Um, along these lines here, um, we have two phases, right? Um, 
And so this line here is called a freezer line. This one here is vaporization line. Um, at the point A, all three phases meet. So that is a uh, triple point, right? If you look at the phase rule for this triple point, so we have one component, right? C is one. We have three phases that meet at that triple point. And we have uh, pressure and temperature, so that is two. So we have zero degrees of freedom. So we can, cannot do anything um, in, in this phase. For example, when you are in a solid or a gas or liquid, you have, um, you have um, two degrees of freedom, right? And so you can change the pressure or temperature. Along each of line, you have only one degree of freedom. So you will change only pressure, but then temperature will have to change, um, will be kept constant. All right. If we have a system that consists of two components, we must add a composition axis and to this uh, PT plot. So before it was just one, right? One component, which was water. Now let's say we have two different um, components. So let's say we have copper and zinc. So now we have to add a composition axis. Um, and so now it's a 3D phase, a 3D graph or phase diagram. For simplicity, we can assume that the pressure is constant, it's at one atmosphere, and this 3D graph can then be turned into 2D graph. Um, and so we only have T versus X composition uh, in this case graph. And we'll see later on what, what it looks like. In this case, the Gibbs phase rule um, will be written in this form where it's F equals C minus B plus one. One, remember, two was for pressure and temperature, and one is now because it's only temperature, right? We set constant pressure. All right, so binary phase diagram. As I said, we have this is two components, A and B, and this is our temperature y axis and x axis is a composition axis. So in this direction, we have a x axis increasing of B, concentration of B, and the other direction is an in, increase of, uh, of A. So zero here for A, zero here for B. Can you see me, my, the pointer? Yes. Okay. Um, so different other different regions here. Uh, you can see that there is a this region about about these two lines is where there is only liquid. Um, in this region between these two lines here and here, you have a mixed phase. It's a liquid plus solid. Um, in this region, there is solid. This region, there is solid, and solid here. The line that separates liquid from the mixed phase, which is liquid and solid, is called a liquidus line. So we have one liquidus line here and another liquidus line here. Um, the solidus line separates liquid um, and solid, liquid plus solid and solid. So in this case, that's liquidus line, so, sorry, solidus line. We have a solidus line here. We also have a solvus line, which separates um, one solid solution from a mixture of solid solutions, like in here, alpha and alpha plus beta. And in this case, Sobel's line also shows limits of solubility. Um, we also have a eutectic point here. You see there's liquid coming all the way and touches here, the uh, solidus line. So the eutectic point is a point where A and B can coexist in equilibrium with the binary liquid mixture. That's a very important uh, point and very useful, um, very useful for single crystal growth, as I will mention later. Okay. Again, so in this one phase region uh, of this phase diagram, so we can change um, temperature and composition of B um, independently. That's based on the Gibbs. Um, phase rule. In this two phase region, we have only one degree. So we have two degrees of freedom here. We have one degree of freedom here. So we can um, change either the temperature or the composition, uh, but not both together. And then in at the 
eutectic point. That's just like the triple point, right? We have all three phases meet together. So we have zero degree of freedom. So we cannot change anything at this point. So it's a very stable point. All right, let's look at um, some real phase diagram, binary phase diagram. So here we have a phase diagram of copper nickel. So here's the temperature, uh, it's in Celsius. We have composition, sometimes these are in Kelvin, so please pay attention. <clears throat> So you have 273 degrees uh, of whatever you're planning to do. Uh, so copper and nickel, it's a uh, hundred percent of nickel, and the other way is hundred. This at this point is hundred percent of copper. We have a liquid, homogeneous liquid about this liquidus line here. That's the liquidus line. We have a mix, a uh, two-phase region here, uh, alpha plus liquid, and then the, there's our solidus line. And this is a um, solid. So here is the melting temperature of copper, and there is melting temperature of nickel. In this case, when you see a phase diagram like this, uh, that indicates that there is infinite um, or unlimited solubility in the liquid and in the solid of these of copper and nickel. And that is possible because both copper and nickel have the same crystal structure, um, the phase um, centered cubic. Similar radii, electronegativity and balance. Um, so if you were to pull down and, and go from liquid, let's say at this point, you, well, what you would see is that here it would be just um, uniform homogeneous liquid. If you go in two phase region here, you'll have a liquid solution plus some um, crystallites of solid solution, in this case, alpha. And as you go all the way into the solid, you have a polycrystal uh, solid solution. There are many more of these isomorphous systems, and these are sometimes useful. So we have copper, nickel, tungsten, molybdenum, gold, silver, and so on. Another useful concept to know is a uh, lever rule. And that helps you to uh, find the amount of phases in a two phase region, like in the liquid plus uh, solid region. So first, what, what you need to do, um, if you need to locate the composition and temperature in this um, TX diagram, so that would be our red line, so that is composition C naught. We'll draw a tie line, that would be the temperature that we are interested at. And this tie line starts at point X on the liquidus line and adds at point Y on the solidus line. And then to determine the fraction of the phase, we take the length of, uh, let's say we want to find uh, the amount of solid. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to say this is a concentration of solid at the Y um, point. This is concentration of liquid right at the X point. So to determine the fraction of a solid, you take the tie line from the phase boundary of the other phase. So it's Mx if you go for solid, other, so the liquid. Mx divided by xy. So the length of the whole timeline. And in terms of concentration, that will be uh, C sub O minus C sub L divided by C sub S minus C sub L. So just the concentration of liquid minus uh, a whole concentration, difference between concentration of um, it's a big percent, percentage of solid and liquid. If you want to find the fraction of liquid, you take my divided by xy, right? It's again the line from m to the solidus line. So it's the opposite boundary. All right, let's look at a better example where we have some numbers. So here we have a tie line um, at oops, sorry, at a 1250 uh, degrees Celsius, right? And we have our, we want to know at point B, I'm sorry, what is the ratio of, um, what is the concentration of nickel and what's the concentration of li uh, liquid? So again, we draw the tie line from li the liquidus to solidus um, curves. 
And then we know that at our point B, the concentration, the weight percent of nickel is 35. And then at C alpha, we have um, 42.5. And at CL, it's 31.5. So the mass fraction for the liquid is then um, solid, which is um, in this case, C sub alpha minus C naught divided by a whole length of tie line. So that gives us 0.68. And then the mass fraction of a solid is going to be this um, length of a tie line, which is C not CO minus CL divided by the length of the whole tie line, right? That's 0.32. So this lever rule is a mechanical analogy to the mass balance calculation as is shown here. And the tie line in the two phase region is um, very similar to the um, um, the tie line in the two phase region is uh, that of um, about a balance um, um, similar to the fulcrum, right? So we have the mass fraction of liquid, we have a mass fraction of solid. And we can balance them on, on the fulcrum, a lever arm, uh, balance that on the lever arm on the fulcrum. If you were to look microscopically, what happens in these isomorphous um, alloys on the slope pooling, and that was again an example of isomorphous uh, alloy and how you calculate the uh, weight fractions, the mass fractions. Again, if we are at point A here, you have a liquid, uh, which has a 35% uh, of nickel, right? If you start to cool and you hit a liquid this line, at this liquid, at this point, you have um, crystal, the nickel will start to crystallize. And we have now there's again 35% nickel, and then the solid is 46% um, 46 of nickel. And you read that from again this lever arm and um, solid is um, when it, that lever arm hits the solid is light. If you go to point C, now our liquid line is um, at 32% of nickel. We have now more, um, so liquid, liquid becomes less nickel rich and solid becomes more nickel rich. And as we go um, to point D, again, we have even less liquid and more of uh, solid. And at point E, it is all solid, but it's 35% uh, nickel rate at this point. Uh, yes. I'll stop that. Anyone have a question? We have an example of ternary. Is that uh... ternary? Yes, I will have a ternary. Yes. Yes. Other questions? There will be a quiz after. <laughs> All right, let's look at a uh, real uh, binary phase diagram, which you can find in LA phase diagram database. So here's the phase diagram of platinum tin. Um, and again, this is the temperature. This is what you will usually see if you were to look for platinum tin um, binary phase diagram. We have a melting temperature of platinum. We have melting temperature of tin. Um, we have homogeneous liquid, which is denoted by L, uh, about all of these, um, about the liquidus line. Here's our liquidus line all around here. Um, yeah, this is the liquidus line. There is now solid and solidus lines, which are these uh, flat regions right here. There are solids, uh, which are the regions um, between these are denoted here, right? We have a bunch of solids. Solid this line separates the two-phase region where there's liquid uh, plus solid. Um, we see that we have a few compounds uh, here. These are called line compounds or stoichiometric compounds because they have a well-defined composition. 
And that composition is denoted by their chemical formula. So we have platinum 310, platinum 10, and so on. So we have one, two, three, four, five compounds, line compounds. Um, for example, if you look at the silver and barium phase diagram, and you find here barium silver uh, five, that compound is a non stoichiometric compound or intermediate phase. And it's non stoichiometric because the composition of that phase varies um, over a finite range. All right, let's go back to our uh, platinum 10 phase diagram. The important point here is a, again, that there's eutectic point, um, which means easy to melt from Greek, and it's great for solution flux growth, although here it's rather high in temperatures. But if you were to look for, um, <clears throat> for proper flux, you would try to look for, let's say you want to use the two um, elements as a flux, so binary, binary flux. In that case, it would look for a um, phase diagram where you have both plat not platinum tin, but let's say um, element A and B, and you have a eutectic point, which is much lower than um, 1100 Celsius, right? Uh, another thing to note here is that platinum 310 and platinum 10 are both congruently melting compounds. And they tr that means they transform from a homogeneous liquid. So if you were to pull exactly on these uh, on this concentration of platinum 310, <clears throat> that will transform from a um, homogeneous liquid um, at this melting point to a homogeneous solid, platinum 310, and vice versa. So if you were to melt that at this composition, that alloy, then you would go from a, a homogeneous liquid solid to homogeneous liquid. These kinds of compounds can be grown by different techniques, can be either flux or uh, Tchaikovsky or Bridgman. Um, <clears throat> the other compounds in this um, system are incongruently melting. So platinum 2, 10, 3, platinum 10, 2, and platinum 10, 4. So they decompose pretty tactically into mixed um, solid and liquid phase, as shown here, for example, for platinum 10, 3. Once you melt this compound, you hit this region here, which is liquid plus platinum tin, right? Um, <clears throat> and they will only form a homogeneous liquid about this, um, about this liquid this line. So again, and I don't know, did I skip this? I wanted to go back, right. So in this region of a phase diagram or in this in between two compounds you have a mixture of platinum 310 plus platinum 10. In this region here, because this is a platinum 10, you have a liquid plus platinum 10 solid. In this here, you have a liquid plus platinum 2103, uh, liquid plus platinum uh, 102, and so on. Here we have liquid plus platinum 104. So let's look what happens if we try to cool a homogeneous liquid with the platinum tin four composition. So if let's say we start here at this point. So for, first, when we try to cool down, we hit the liquid this line, right? And at this point, platinum, let me move this out of the way. At this point, platinum um, 10, 2 will start to precipitate, right? And as we uh, go down and temperature uh, cool down, so we have more and more of platinum 10, 2, our uh, liquid, which we can read concentration of 10, we have 10 rich liquid at this point, right? That 10 rich um, liquid or amount of um, concentration of 10 liquid, we can read from this line. As we go down below this peritactic temperature of 504 degrees uh, Celsius, we'll start to precipitate platinum tin four. And then um, the remaining liquid becomes more tin rich. So um, we have a heterogeneous or two phase region right here. And so um, that is why we're gonna be um, 
precipitate in different 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 phases, right? Different compounds. So as we go down onto this temperature, let's say this temperature, this is our final temperature. As I said, we since we started from here, we have platinum 102, we have platinum 104, and tin rich liquid. Well, what a mess, right? We have two different compounds. Um, let's say, but you only wanted platinum 104. So we cannot grow platinum 104 if we start from the same concentration uh, uh, in liquid as platinum 104 solid, right? So it doesn't work the same way as for congruently melting compounds. So how do we grow platinum 104? Well, we can use a, a liquid design here for platinum 104. It's a, actually a, a very broad, well, quite, kind of a little bit steep liquid design. So in other words, we can go platinum 104 out of cell flux or excess of tin. And you can grow it by using the following concentration of platinum and tin. And if you uh, raise the, the mixture of platinum and tin to 600 degrees Celsius and then cool it over 60, degree, 60 hours to 350 degrees at which temperature you will decan the excess uh, tin, you will get a single crystals of platinum tin 4. And platinum tin, tin 4 has very interesting properties. You're welcome to read the paper. So this also is called deep peritactic because platinum four, uh, platinum tin four is very deep um, in, in this phase diagram. All right, so let's see how this, um, what actually happens in the crucible as you pull down your melt uh, from initial, from, from initial, from 600 degrees Celsius. So initially at this point, you have, at this point here, before you hit the liquid this line, you have a homogeneous liquid, which is 96% tin rich, and you have zero solid, no solid yet. Once you hit the um, liquid this line, the solid will start to precipitate. And let's say at this point here, you already have some platinum tin four, and your um, liquid is 98% tin. As you keep pulling down, so at this point here, you have more solid, which is shown here, and you, your um, liquid is 99% tin rich. And the composition of the liquid changes because we crystallize different from initial melts to constitute geometry. And again, we read the uh, amount of tin from the liquid is line as we cool. So the phase diagram that are published are not always complete or accurate. Um, and you have to uh, be very careful because sometimes they are extrapolated. Um, and so a few, a few tries to optimize the condition, the composition and cooling rate to grow crystals are required. Any questions here? Yeah, I'm not done yet. I'm not done. But, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, just can you go back one slide? So I just want to make sure everyone understands uh, this concept. So as you're cooling down the red arrow, uh, who can tell me in the audience why when you hit the, the liquidus line, does the composition start to change? Okay. So as you're as you're coming down here, you get this red, this red star. Why do you start to slide down this liquid? Is it a little louder? Okay. I'm sorry. Say again. You're consuming the amount of platinum. You can yes. Right. You're starting to precipitate out the platinum compound, so the remaining tin liquid gets more rich, right? You actually change, you move in the composition. Good. Any other questions? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah um, so in the example that you're using there, uh, it seems convenient that you have like a range of temperatures in which you're precipitating the crystal. So then 
if you have a, a big range of temperatures, then you can do this slowly. When you have a congruently, congruently melting compound, say that you have platinum tin 1-1, one, one. Um, if you slide it slightly at the composition, you would have like a very small temperature range, is that correct? So how far apart of that exact composition would you stand for a congruently melting compound? I don't know. That, that's, a, that's a good question. Um... Well, in this case, you're also limited. Let's say if it's platinum tin, you will be limited and how high in temperature you can take the quartz, right? The quartz melt at 1200 degree Celsius. So you cannot go higher than that. So that would be your limiting concentration in this case. Yeah. <clears throat> the maximum points if I drop the temperature, what, uh, what indicates which direction my composition is going to the right? Left. How will I determine whether my composition is going to the left or the right? It's I'm at kind of the middle of the composition. Here? No, I couldn't hear. Could you repeat, please? So you're coming towards, you're cooling towards the maximum, like platinum tin. Uh, what determines whether you slide down the right or the left side? Um, the left or right side will give you, for example, uh, in this case, I would choose the right side because you have a longer uh, liquidus line. So you can precipitate more of platinum tin. And also, it's a, so the lower temperature uh, allows you to, um, like the lower span of liquidus line allows you to, to get more crystals because it's more accessible, right? As opposed to, let's say, this side here. So here you would be limited by this eutectic point. So we have to spend somewhere at 1150, right? So when you, you have a very limited um, temperature window in that case. So the, the larger the window, the better would be. How, how I'm able to direct. So, right. So Helena, when you say choose, you mean you don't put the concentration exactly in. 50, you would. No, 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 no. If I'm trying to grow platinum tin, I would not go directly on this. I would, let's say, start somewhere here, right, at this concentration. Whatever this is, it, I would draw a 1200 degree line, let's say here. I don't know where it is. And that, that would tell me the concentration that I need to start with. Actually, I will go a little bit lower than 1200 degrees Celsius so that I can um, make sure that I'm not so I need to make sure that I go into homogeneous liquid, right? So let's say if you choose this concentration here, you can only go to 1200 degrees Celsius. You, you will have a mixed phase, right? At this highest temperatures, you will not have homogeneous liquid. You'll have liquid plus platinum tin, or actually, I don't know what you will have because platinum may not even melt at that point. Um, so you need to pick the concentration. So you are initially at the homogeneous liquid. When you, when you increase the temperature to 12 degrees Celsius, that you will be in a homogeneous liquid. And then you, when you cool down, you will hit the liquidus line and then precipitate platinum tin. So I guess you would start somewhere perhaps with this concentration here, right? So you'll have um, about uh, 58 of tin, and 42 of platinum, and you would go to 1200 degrees Celsius, degree Celsius, and then you would cool it down to perhaps 850, slowly cool to 850, and then um, decant or spin at 850 the liquid, the liquid tin. Uh, here in the Brian, any other suggestions on how to do? I've never done congruently melting compounds, so but this would how would I approach it? So another two questions. So is there any situation where you would use basically the congruent melting like that line, or is it just that you're controlling the control with this like map, or because you said you want to use it for this, is that because of your like work with the control of conditions, or is there ever Could you please repeat the question? Uh, is there ever a situation where you want to use the 
grow your vegetables. JP, I cannot hear. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I can answer. So, um, it, so the point of the congruent melting line is that whether you're, uh, let's say, on platinum tin, if you're a bit to the right or to the left, will still precipitate that exact compound. Yeah. That's nice. You want that compound. When you have a, um, a called width of formation, like was shown previously, then you know there's a variation in the, in the, in the geometry. I think that's does that answer your question. So when you have this line compound and you have a liquid, a nice liquidous line on each side, you have a lot of phase space to grow that compound. Okay. Does that make sense? So you don't want to get that line completely on the Yeah, you don't want to come straight down on the line because then uh, what determines which direction you go will uh, depend on on your exact concentration and maybe even non-equilibrium conditions. Uh, there was a question at the top. Uh, can I fo fo follow on this question? So if you go on exact uh, concentration for this case, well, that is too high for the course. But let's say if it's lower than that, you'll get polycrystalline platinum tin. But in this case, if you want to go exactly on the composition, you can also use a third flux, let's say, I don't know what else that would. So this would be your, your line compound. And then the third flux, it'll be a, like a, a diagram here where you essentially use this compound as a, instead of let's say platinum. So that would be platinum tin. And let's say this will be antimony or something like that, right? And so you can, you can actually, because this congruent amount of compound, which means you can form, I wish I could draw. <laughs> you can, um, yeah. this, this lets you access this, this composition without this mixed space here. If you were, I, I should have had a different um, example. So what I'm trying to say, if, if you go, let's say, if you use Bridgman and Chakralski, which you can go high in temperature, you would actually, use exactly platinum tin concentration, one one concentration to grow the crystal. It's just for the flux growth, you need to have liquid. Otherwise you won't be able to grow, you know, you will, you will get polycrystalline stuff, but you won't get single crystal. So the beauty of the flux is, I sometimes the curse, you need the liquid. So the lo longest the liquid is lined, that is the side that you would, you would want to use. Like, you know, for example, platinum tin three, you would want to use this liquid as line. So you would want to try different concentration on this, on this liquid as line from here, 898 Celsius, 748 Celsius. For the platinum tin two, you would use this, this liquid as line, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, one more question. That was my question. <laughs> Okay, See, I can read your mind. <laughs> okay, go ahead. No more question? All right. So experimentally, uh, the, the phase diagram I experimentally determined, and it's extremely hard and difficult, and it's, um, it is a lot of work. If you, some, if you have time, if you Google any of the binary phase diagram um, in journal of alloy and compounds, you can, you can see that you know, when people do that, there's a lot of data points and they sometimes you can see, you know, you won't see this nice phase diagram, but you will actually see the data points, the composition that they, they, that they um, studied and they put them then on the, um, on the phase diagram. So it involves an x-ray diffraction, chemical analysis, bilatometry, thermal analysis, analysis. They do optical microscopy and just, it's just enormous amount of work. So something that we, we take for granted like this here, right? It takes years of okay. hard work. <laughs> so finally, um, question? Nope. All right, binary phase diagram. Well, how about if you have three components, right? You have now A, B, C component. So in that case, you have a ternary phase diagram, which is sort of similar to binary. Um, so you have this triangle here, that's your um, A, B, and C composition. 
and on each vertical axis you have a temperature. And let's say for this particular um, ternary, you have, um, first of all, on this side, you have a binary of AB. On this side, you have a binary of a BC. So same binaries as we, let's say this is platinum tin, and this is antimony that I was talking about. I don't know if that will exist, but it's just fictitious uh, phase diagram. So you have platinum tin. This is our eutectic point here. If this were to be tin and this is antimony, let's say there is another eutectic here. And there is platinum antimony and there is another eutectic here. And so these can be also form a third ternary eutectic here. And if this were to be, let's say here, platinum tin, and you were to have antimony here, this would be the cut on the platinum tin and antimony, like the vertical cut would be this platinum tin and antimony binary phase diagram that I was talking about. If you were to look at this, so here is our melting temperatures for A, B, and C. And um, if you were to look at the top of this, you have this, um, this triangle map, right? These are um, eutectic points. These are our binaries. So eutectic point here, 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 that's a uh, ternary eutectic. This is our phase A plus liquid, phase B plus liquid, and phase C plus liquid. Now the ternary phase diagram are beautiful, right? It's three-dimensional, but it's hard for us to, to think in terms of 3D and to look at things in 3D. So most often what we do when we, uh, when we consider growing a ternary, we look at the temperature, constant temperature cuts. So in temp when we pick, let's say, cut at constant temperatures, so let's say we cut at this dash, dash lines here, right? So that's our, I don't know, 200, 300 degrees Celsius. And you can go on in these, um, you know, cut, cut, constant temperature cuts. So we have this triangle of A, B, and C, that's called the Gibbs triangle. What it means is, now you see their numbers, so now how we read concentration of each element is at each vert vertice. So here we have 100% of A, here we have 100% of B, 100% of C. If you look at B, this line here gives us 10% of B, then 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90, and 100. The same for A, starts in, from opposite side, so 10, 20, 30, and so on. And for C, we have, this is zero line for C, 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on, okay? So again, zero from, for B here, go up, zero for A here, go to this point here, zero from here, go to point C. So let's say, in addition to that, we have on each side, this is AB binary, this is BC binary, and this is AC binary. Uh, you will see later on what I mean. Let's say you want to find um, a compound that has a composition of 50, 10, 40. So to make that, that means the B was a 10, so that's that 10 line. Now C is at 40, this is our 40 line for C, and A is at 50, so this is 50 line for A. So that intersection of three lines gives us the, this concentration of 50, 10, 40, okay? Is that clear for everyone? Good. Now, you can also find a, a point here where all three A, B, and C have exactly the same concentration, right? So that would be um, in this triangle here. It's approximately, I don't know what else. But, uh, all right. So here, let's look at real case. I want to grow cerium copper to germanium too. So here's my copper, germanium, and cerium uh, ternary phase, phase diagram. You would also want to put any other ternaries of cerium, copper, and germanium that are known on this phase diagram. So how would you grow this cerium, copper, to germanium too? Well, um, first you would find where on the ternary this uh, one to two is. Right, so it's five, five divided by, 100 divided by five, that's 20, so it's 20, uh, 40, and 40, right? So 20 for cerium, and then 40 and 40 for copper and germanium. 
So that is where that location of the serum copper to germanium to it. Now I will add the binaries. Remember I told you there are binaries on each of this line. So there's this copper germanium binary. Look at this beautifully detected here. And there's serum um, germanium, should be flipped, I'm sorry, um, binary. And this is our serum copper binary here. Again, there's a nice detector here as well. Um, and that would be a tactic somewhere here as well, right? Uh, and if, if you were to, to really do it carefully, you would also mark where the eutectics are on, on this zero line. So if you look at the copper germanium, right, you don't want to go into cerium rich side because cerium is, first of all, there could be another ternary compounds, right? Cerium also uh, will attack your uh, alumina crucible. Um, and quartz if, if you try to use serum as those flux. Plus, it's also expensive. And also a high melting temperature, right? So you wouldn't want to go in this region. Uh, however, if you look at copper germanium, as I mentioned, this is a nice um, eutectic point here at about 35 of germanium and 40, 35 germanium and 65 of copper. So what, we, what you can do actually, you can use that and a little bit of cerium. So you can actually start out a point here, which is 4% um, of cerium, right? And then um, equal concentration of copper and germanium to make 100. And so that would be a starting point to grow cerium copper to germanium. Too. And that is exactly what I did actually is 5% of cerium uh, and copper 0.45 and germanium, so 45% of copper, 45% of germanium, and 5% of cerium. And so you would put these ingredients in alumina crucible. This is 5 ml aluminum, alumina crucible. Um, you use another inverted crucible with quartz wool on top. That is to contain the spin. So here, in this case, this, we are going to be spinning a copper and germanium liquid, right? Because that's our, so we have somewhere here on the eutectic but actually 50-50, so somewhere here. Um, so if you look at the 50-50, now you see that I'm warming it up to 1190 degrees Celsius and slowly cooled over 200 degrees to 825 degrees Celsius. And I read that 825, again, from this 50-50 concentration here, right? So 825 will be somewhere here. Now I wanna, since I don't know if this eutectic line is, liquidus line is correct, I want to be a little bit higher in temperature to make sure I don't I don't hit this um, mixed space right region. Plus, your furnace temperature may not exactly be 825 degrees Celsius, so you need to, you know, you need to give yourself a little bit of room when you try to grow and don't take these these values for granted. Again, it may require a few tries to get a nice, beautiful crystals. Well, this was the crystals that I got. Um, but um, again, if, if this binary phase diagram is not complete, then you may not get just one phase, right? You will get um, some other phases in there as well. So that's why X-ray diffraction, once you get your crystals, is very, very important, all right? Unless you, um, if it's your first growth, or if you even if you follow recipes from uh, someone else's paper, Still, you still need to do extra diffraction in order to confirm that the phase that you get is the exact phase. Sometimes these recipes are inaccurate. Uh, unfortunately, not everyone believes that sharing the right um, recipe is a good idea, um, but that's something you shouldn't be doing. You always should put the correct recipe um, in your paper. All right, so that was the case of cerium copper to germanium too. Any questions at this point? Oh, All right, so another ternary nickel uh, tantalum um, titanium at a thousand degrees Celsius. This is actually the, the actual ternary from a paper. There's no ternary compounds here, but you can see how complicated uh, this ternary phase diagram is, right? You see different regions with different, um, different phases, these are all binaries present. So it can be extremely complicated. Um, 
it takes enormous amount of work to construct the binary, but it takes even more work to get to the ternary phase diagram. All right, so we did the ternary phase diagram. How about quaternary phase diagram? <laughs> well, it's possible. So William Mayer, when he was a graduate student in Paul Kent, his lab um, was tasked with growing calcium, um, potassium iron for arsenic for. And so he came up with the um, this kind of approach to do the quaternary growth. You have a 3D, uh, sorry, tetrahedron here. So you have calcium, iron, and then potassium and arsenic, right? You see that? 3D? Now, um, because of a lot of these iron arson arsenides one to two and one or four are grown out of iron arsenic, he also used this, remember each of this line is a binary, right? This is binary, this is binary, and this is binary, and this is also binary. So here you have iron arsenic bi bi binary, sorry, this is iron two arsenic, and here's iron arsenic. And if you take this iron arsenic, and you use calcium and uh, potassium. Here is the, now it's ternary, our familiar ternary phase diagram, right? So here's where the uh, 1144 forms, um, actually, in terms of Fuchs composition. And here's the one to two and another one to two. And here the red one, this is zoomed out, zoomed in for portion of this triangle. This, this, this little red shaded region is region where the pure crystals of 1144 can be grown. And so that is exactly here. All, all these letters is, are the concentration that he tried in order to grow um, single crystals, which are shown here of uh, calcium, potassium, iron, or arsenic form. And if you're interested more into, into how, you can read his thesis, and there's more, even more information. But OK, we have four elements. How about more elements? Well. <laughs> Complicated. You can probably also play the same trick um, as here. So trying to, um, with a fifth element, try to create maybe a 3D tetrahedron and then convert it to 3D and so on. But it's extremely complicated. Um, and yeah, there's not many five elements compounds that are studied. I would like to uh, finish with the same slide I started. This is again uh, the most important source of all the information for everyone who wants to do crystal growth. And I'll take any other questions you may have. I don't know where I should end here. I cannot hear, sorry. The question was, uh, she saw that some solidus lines were dashed lines. Um, I would stay away from those. <laughs> Uh, this may not be, uh, sometimes uh, the phase diagrams are also calculated. Um, if you can find, uh, if, you, if you can find a, a paper where actually the phase diagram is being studied and that dash line isn't there, um, that paper would tell you what that particular author meant by this dash line. Either that the, um, sometimes these dash lines are there to indicate that this perhaps is because they studied only one composition and so um, of, of alloy, and they were able to put only one data point. And so they are not sure where that in terms of temperature um, or a composition that that solid line is. So sometimes they may put it as a dash line. But again, I would suggest to go uh, try to track down that. that so even for these phase diagrams here, um, even for these phase, let's go to binary phase diagram. This beautiful phase diagram, if you go to the phase, um, uh, alloy phase diagram database, it will tell you all the um, references that this phase diagram was built upon. And you can go back to that uh, 
you know, to check the reference, what, what is meant by that dashed line. There's also, uh, there's also a theory, there's calculations which, which calculate some of these lines, and sometimes it's mixed. Right, okay. a lot of... Go ahead. So, so, okay, in this example, um, we're saying that as you cool, you're pre precipitating your plant. But is there a case where you actually get platinum coated with tin? Or if you want like some small amount of doping, is that in the platinum split phase? Or I guess where is that phase diagram? If you wanted to dope in on the platinum side, on the tin side? Yeah. Well, then you are talking about a ternary phase diagram. So you would have to build something similar to, to the ternary in a way. And so that would be your uh, platinum, tin, and then another doping you want to try to do. And that would be, you know, your platinum, tin two, let's say is in this corner. And so this corner, you will see um, if you can get, um, I mean, it depends what kind of doping you want to do. If you're trying to do the doping in the same, let me look at my phase diagram. Um, if you want to do palladium and nickel doping on, on, on the platinum side, right, these are all are the same, the same column and periodic table. So you may just, um, well, first you want to try if there is, you, um, you want to see if there is a palladium tin four compound and there is um, nickel tin four compound formed. Because uh, if there is no, um, it depends what kind of doping. If you want to do doping from, let's say, platinum, palladium, right? If you want to do palladium all the way from uh, from 100% platinum to 100% palladium, then you need to make sure that palladium tin four exists, and it's in the same, um, in the same has the same crystal structure. Well, it doesn't have to have the same crystal structure. But then, if once you do um, you do the doping and you grow different batches, you'll have to see if uh, which phase goes, you know, when you dope system, uh, which crystal structure is gonna adopt either platinum tin four or platinum tin four, or they may be actually miscible. And so you, you may end up in some composition where you have platinum tin four and palladium tin four. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess I was wondering, just in this example, like you can have solid platinum, and then as you slowly increase tin, then there's going to be a, like uh, you're going to go from having platinum that's doped with tin, like to having phase segregation of platinum and of tin. I guess. And I guess where in the phase diagram would that, or you have new phases of platinum three tin showing up. I think, can I rephrase the question? Yeah. Uh -huh. What happens if you're thinking about substituting tin into the platinum site? Oh, is it gonna go? <laughs> I mean, these are two different, um, two different elements. The answer is it's not represented in this phase diagram. And you have the way up formation here. So uh, in the lab, like the, the one phase uh, blue part of the diagram of the lab that is already solid. The question is, is that a width for a platinum rich side? Is that a width of formation? On a platinum rich side. If you were trying to dope uh, on the tin side, on the platinum rich side? I, I, sorry, I don't, I couldn't, can I hear the question well? Okay, but you have 10% in substitute in the platinum QR phase. So I, I don't know if I'm phrasing it correctly. Um, like you have a phase for platinum, right? And you can mm -hmm. have 10% of tin substitute there or 9% or 8%. As, as long as you're quenching maybe from, uh, well, you, you have, have yeah. you have a 10% of platinum? Or say 5% of 
sorry, 5% of 10 inside the diagram. 5% of 10. Okay, so if you have 5% of 10, you're on this side of phase diagram. Yeah, say that you see it till 1100, uh, and then you quench it, or then you pull down to 900, and then you quench. Wouldn't you have like that uh, thin substitution there in the platinum because of the width of formation? Uh, this is not a bit of formation. This is solubility of platinum. Uh, you, if you were to cool down here on this uh, point, you would have uh, platinum, and you would have probably the pieces of tin, but these won't be substituted. This will be, this will be two different um, regions in there. It's pure platinum. It's not a width. Yeah, it's not a width of formation. It's just a weird color. <clears throat> it's just a solid platinum. But if it's not white, it's just one phase, right? I know, I know. This is the way this they, they, the, this alloy phase diagram database represents. So it should be just white. Okay. It's not liquid. Yeah, be aware of colors. Yeah, <laughs> should use different colors. Okay, any final question? Okay, you're, so your, uh, your, your phase diagram questions can be directed to Helena via email. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> or ask us, we'll try to answer your questions. Uh, but Helena, thanks very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, and good luck. Have fun. <laughs>